And I invite everybody that we may open up our Bibles to the letter to the first of Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 27 and 28. Glory to the Lord. That's first Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 27 and 28. May the Lord's word bless you, keep you, strengthen you, correct you, exhort you, and straighten you. And the same go for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because the word of the Lord is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I hope that the Lord bless you in this precious afternoon. We read the scripture in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And the scripture says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. God is mighty in the midst of his people. Amen. Mighty is the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. This title of this message, brethren, is the victorious are found worthy. The victorious are found worthy, brethren. The portion that we have read here today is a portion taken from, as we read, 1st of Corinthians. It was a letter that was given to the church of Corinthians. Now, this was a letter that was actually uh, sent to them by the Apostle Paul. A letter that was sent to a church that was classified more Gentiles. So it was less Jews in that church, but there was more Gentiles in that church. So that's non-Jewish uh, descendants that were making up the bulk of number of that church in Corinthians. And so therefore, brethren, this church that had a lot of problems, that had all the gifts, they believed in Jesus, but they were filled with problems. There was sin in the church. There was disorder in the church. There were so many things going wrong, including when it came to celebrating the good ordinance that Jesus Christ left for us, known as the Lord's Supper, or others know it as Holy Communion. And so that's why in this entire letter that uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he spent some time writing to them and letting them know a few things about the order that God has left for when doing Holy Communion. Now, every single Christian, brethren, it's every single Christian's duty to take part in Holy Communion. But depends on how we are, will depend on whether we are found worthy to take part or not. Now, this is something that doesn't have to do with, you know, somebody else judging you here. This is, as I've mentioned before, brethren, the fact that when we do Holy Communion, each of us present ourselves before our judge, our God, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And he is the one that judges because he's the only one that can judge righteously. You know, he sees at the most profound of what is in our heart. He knows every single thing. And so that's why when we read this portion, and I'll read it again, when it gets to this portion that um, the Apostle Paul is actually talking about how to perform the Holy Communion, he gets to a certain point. If we go back to verse 27 and verse 28, he comes to a certain point, And when he's speaking to the church... We've got to remember that the church is made up of believers. Firstly, those who have believed in the death, the resurrection, uh, the ascension of Jesus Christ. You know, the, the salvation process, the, the work of salvation in our life. So the work of God in our life through Jesus. And when we come to believe in Jesus Christ, then we also need to be baptized. That's one of the other ordinances that God has left for his people. And so when we believe in Jesus and we've come to be baptized in the waters as the Lord has established, then we basically get led by the Holy Spirit. Because remember, every Christian 
when our belief, when our faith has been genuine to receive Christ as our Lord and as our Saviour, then the promise of the Father comes, which is the promise of His Holy Spirit. That is the seal of our guarantee, meaning that we then know that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And it is the Spirit of God that gives testimony with our spirit. He gives witness to our spirit, whether we are sons of God or whether we are not. And this is what allows us to then have a communion with the Spirit of God, where the Spirit of God will start to lead us and go, you are not going to do this anymore. You are not going to go to that place anymore. You will turn off the TV and start praying instead. These are the things that the Holy Spirit starts to work in us. And as we obey the Spirit of the living God, He starts to lead us in that path of sanctification and consecration. And so therefore, when it came to this particular church, the Church of Corinthians, and they were talking about Holy Communion, Paul says to them, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup, referring to Holy Communion, he says, if we do it in an unworthily manner, that we will be found to be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. In other words, when we think back to what the scripture says about those men, Roman soldiers, as well as the religious uh, leaders of the Jews, which you know, betrayed Jesus and took Jesus to go and get uh, the death sentence, you could say. And when Pontius Pilate, you know, made the death sentence, the Roman soldiers got him. They whipped him. They ripped his, his beard out and they spat on him. They ridiculed him and so many things, taking him to the cross. These are the things that the scripture is telling us that we will be guilty like if we were back there as one of those people who were spitting on Jesus, who were hitting Jesus, who were hating Jesus, who were mocking Jesus and who were laughing at his death. That is what this is actually saying, brethren. He says, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And verse 28 then says, but let a man, so that's let everyone examine themselves. So we all need to examine ourselves, even though, yes, this is a day of celebration. This is a day of joy because we are here to obey that ordinance, which tells us as Christians that we need to obey the Lord in taking part of Holy Communion. But at the same time, we need to examine ourselves if we are in the faith. It says, let everyone examine themselves and so let him eat, you see. So he's saying, if we examine ourselves, we pass the test, then let us take part and eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. And this is why when we examine ourselves, brethren, you see, we've got to examine ourselves because God has given you and given me. When he created us, he created us a spirit, soul and body in your human spirit, in my human spirit. That's where the Holy Spirit's going to speak to us in our conscience and in our conscience. He'll be like, hmm, what are we doing? What have we been doing today? What have we been doing in the week? What have we been doing in the month? Am, am I pleasing before my father? Does my father, is, is he pleased with me? Now, each of us can know this. Each of us can know this in our spirit, in our conscience. We can know this, whether God is approving us or he's disapproving us. We can know that. And this is why when we are genuinely sincere with God, as Christians who have the spirit of God, must have that communion with the Lord, must understand how to have that communion with the Lord. If you may not understand it yet, well, that's why as a church we are here to help. 
so that you can understand how to. But I'll show you, brethren, what the Scripture says as to how we are to examine ourselves. You see, you and I, as human beings, have three enemies. Because the prize is your soul. The prize is my soul. And where we want to go, our, our free will is in between. Do we choose life or do we choose death? Do we choose good or do we choose evil? The free will choice is yours and mine. That is the, God, the good God that He has given us a free will choice to choose what we want in life. Do we truly want Jesus or do we not truly want Jesus? That's a decision that each Christian, each person has to make in life. And not just Christians, those who are non-Christians have to make that decision too. Because when the word, the gospel, the good news is given to them, they need to make a decision too. Whether they will receive the word and follow Jesus, or whether they will reject the word and choose not to follow Jesus. So in saying this, brethren, you see, we have three great enemies in this life. You have been made as flesh, body, so uh, uh, spirit, soul, and body. But you also have threefold enemy as well. <laughs> Hallelujah. The threefold enemy you have, brethren, I'll mention them, is the flesh, meaning the fleshly desires. It's not your actual body, because that's your human body, my human body. But what's in that human body, we have desires. And these desires, many times, are the ones that want to do, do those things that are contrary to the Word of God. And so the flesh is one of the biggest enemies we have. Another one we have is the world. When we say the world, we're not talking about us as Christians being people who hate this earth and we hate everything in it. No. What God created, He created good. So when we talk about the world, brethren, we're talking about systems that have been designed by mankind who have been influenced by something. And when they are influenced, they create systems which cause people to lose themselves in those systems. And those systems are oftentimes contrary to the Word of God. And you know, everything that is, that is contrary, everything that is against the Word of God is actually sin. So those systems that have been created in the world are places where we can go and indulge the flesh and lose our time. Things that are not drawing us closer to God. But yet they draw us away from God. Things that instead of uh, causing a desire in us or a feeling in us to, to want more of God. Instead they pull us away and we then don't feel like praying much anymore. We don't feel like reading the word of God much anymore. Because the worldly things are attracting us now. So some of these systems and worldly things brethren. Are things like you could say the casino where people want to go and bet their money why because they have a hope of making more money so these are systems for people who have their heart on the love for money and you see anybody who knows scripture will say well Jesus said the love of money is the root of all evil. There's other systems as well, brethren, that cause us to lose our way, to lose ourselves in the world. For example, the entertainment industry is a big one. People going all different places, all different sports that there are available where we can go and waste our time anywhere we want, basically. But that does not draw us close to God. That leads us away from the Lord if we are not careful. 
Just like that, there's so many other places that I could name, brethren. There's places like what's called a brothel, where people go and, and uh, sin in sexual sins. Things that are contrary to the word of God. And they pay for going and doing these things. But these things are sinful. These things only draw us away from God. But they exist. They exist in the world today. There's even laws that permit them to be there. For those people who want to be drawn to those places. And these places are known as systems of the world. They are designed to cause us to draw away from God. To lose our soul. That's what these systems do. And just like that, there's many, many systems, brethren. But I want to mention also the third enemy of your and my soul. And that is Satan. Satan, his name, may the Lord rebuke him, means adversary. Adversary means like an enemy. Enemy of what? Adversary of what? Contrary of what? Contrary, adversary of the Word of God. Because it is the Word of God that leads us to God. It is the Word of God that leads us to salvation. It is the Word of God that leads us on the path that we should be, brethren. But Satan, may the Lord rebuke him, leads people away from God. But now we're going to have a look at how these three things operate in our life, brethren. Because if we want to know if we are approved by God to take part in Holy Communion. And this is not just for here, brethren. This is what the scripture says. This is wherever we are. Because, for example, you know, in my case or in Sister Martha's or anybody else, when we travel somewhere else, you know, obviously I can't go to my local church. I can't come here if I'm in another state or if I'm in another country. But we seek to congregate in obedience to the word of God that tells us not to stop congregating. So we congregate to go in fellowship with brethren in Christ and continue worshiping God where we find ourselves. But at the same time, brethren, when it comes to doing Holy Communion, the same scripture that's here is the same scripture that I submit to wherever I go. Because God's word is God's word wherever I am. And I need to keep myself for the Lord wherever I am. And so therefore, brethren, when we look at the third enemy, the third enemy being Satan, where the Bible describes him as a cherubim when he was up in heaven. The Bible describes him as rebelling against God in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, says that he would say in his heart, I will be like unto the most high. I will put my throne at the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High were the words that he would say. And when he managed to convince a third of the angels up there, he stirred a rebellion in a war which caused him and all of the fallen angels to be cast out of heaven, out of the presence of God. And so therefore, brethren, you and I have this enemy because, you see, you have been given the opportunity for salvation. He no longer has it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So now let's look at what happens with the flesh then, brethren. Let's look at this enemy of ours. The desires of the flesh. How does this operate? Let's go to James chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. In James chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, the Bible speaks to us about how temptations operate, how they come onto mankind. And the scripture says to us here, we've got it up on the projector as well. It says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? You want to know where the wars come from, all these wars in history and all these uh, Things that rumors of wars that you might hear in the governments in the world today. Well, have a look at this because this is where it, where it comes from. It says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? So it's something that stirs up in each of us. In the lusts of our flesh. 
in the desires of those things that we desire to do. And many times those desires that pop up are desires of the flesh which are contrary to the Word of God. It goes against what God wants. And this is why we need to submit ourselves to the Word of God. That we may deny ourselves how Jesus has said, if you want to be my disciple, he said. Well, he said we have to take up the cross each day. We need to deny ourselves and follow him as our example. And so when we look at the scripture, he says, you lust. Now that word lust, you know what that word means? Lust is when you have such a strong desire. You've been thinking about something. Yeah, let's just say that there's a thought. It just popped in my mind. Hmm, I'd like to do this. I'd like to taste that. I'd like to touch that. That's a thought that just came. But if I let that thought continue, it goes into my emotions. And I start to almost be able to taste that. I can almost see it. I can almost touch it, even though it's not there. And you know what that does? It creates a desire. My emotions start to get drawn to it. And when we start to lose control and say, oh, how, how much I want that, how much I desire that, how much I, I want that now. But if what you want is contrary to the Word of God, this is now what is called lust, brethren, because it is such a strong desire for those things that are against God's will. That is lust. When there is lust, brethren, when we have such a strong desire to do those things or to practice something that is against God's word, and especially when we know that it is against God's word as Christians, especially when we know it is against God's will, he says, you lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You see, what happens many times is people go to war because of their lust, because they want, because they're greed, because they want more money, because they want this one's gold, because they want that one's house, because they want that one's car, because I want to have that one's talents. And we don't seem to be satisfied with what God has given us, with the portion that is rightly and duly ours. You know, another word for that, God said to Moses in the 10th commandment, you shall not covet, you shall not want. Those things that do not belong to us, we shall not have a strong desire to want them. We should be satisfied with what God has given us. But this is why he's saying that we, you know, we don't receive, you know, coming back to Christians, we don't receive because we don't ask properly. You know, I'm sure how many, how many times is there people who have asked God something and have not received it. But then when you realize what is it that we're asking for? Because if we're asking and we say, oh God, give me uh, the latest car, thank you. Because your word says, you know, anything I ask in your name, I shall receive it. So we start to want to say things like, give me the latest BMW of 2022 in Jesus name. Thank you. God knows the intentions of our hearts and what we're going to use that thing for. If he knows that we're stuck on the television all the time watching Need for Speed or uh, Fast and the Furious or all them fast car programs and TV shows, then he knows we're going to go and be wrapped around a pole at 120, 200 kilometers an hour. We're going to go and kill ourselves with that car. So no, he's not going to give you something that he knows you're going to go finish yourself with. No, he's not going to give us something that he knows we're just going to go and, and, and you know, show it off to other people. These are all characteristics that are not right to begin with in the Lord. But how wonderful it is when we, when we say, Lord, I would like to have this because, you know, this way I can increase you in, your, in your kingdom. I can take your word. I'll be able to go and pick up my brethren who need help, you know, in a, in a, to get to church. I'll be able to help the elderly that can't drive anymore. When we align our life to the will of God, brethren, to his kingdom, that's when we're going to see things operate. Amen. But because many people, you know, in the world, they don't know Jesus. 
So that's why they're fighting. That's why they're warring. Because of power, because of, of want. And they do not have because they don't know Jesus. And they're not satisfied with what God has given them. But when we're talking about a church, brethren, why is it that there could be arguments between brethren? Fights, disagreements. Because of the same reason. We don't align our life to the will of God. If we did, then God will answer all our prayers because we would no longer ask Him for things that we know that we are not going to receive. We would no longer ask Him for things that are desires of our flesh. We would ask Him for things that He is pleased with. We would learn how to ask according to His will. And the scripture says, You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. We miss the mark. He says that you may consume it upon your lusts. In other words, he's saying that if we ask for something, he doesn't answer that because we've asked wrong to begin with. We've gone with the desires of our flesh. We've gone with what we want and not with what he wants. Do we get the point? When we learn to ask according to what he wants and not what I want, that's when you're going to see the glory of God. That's when you're going to have your prayers answered. When we do away with the fleshly lusts. But that fleshly lust, brethren, is always with us wherever we go. Because you are in this human body. I am in this human body. And as we are in this human body, we have what's called a fallen nature. And that fallen nature comes in your blood. In my blood. It's in our DNA. So then how do I overcome something that I have inherited by my parents and their grandparents and their grandparents? Christ Jesus is the answer, brethren. Christ Jesus shows us that when we submit to God, we are able to overcome the desires of the flesh. We are able to put a stop to the desires of the flesh. We are able to not take that path, but take the path that Jesus has marked for us. It is only with the strength of God, in the power of His Spirit, in the power of His Word. Hallelujah. Amen. And when we continue reading this verse, brethren, because this, this uh, enemy that we have, the desires of the flesh, this enemy, you are your greatest enemy. I am my greatest enemy. Because the scripture also says in verse 3, um, we'll read it again. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. That you may consume it upon your lusts. And verse 4 then goes on to say, You adulterers and adulteresses, you uh, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Look at that, brethren. This has jumped on to the next part. Because... You see, if I'm following the desires of my flesh, the lusts of my flesh, they're going to draw me to do something. They're going to draw me to practice something. And I'm going to go and practice something in this world. And that something is not right before God. And look at how he calls us. Because you've got to remember that God considers you and I as the bride, as his church. And Jesus is the groom. And we, as the bride, are waiting for Jesus to come for his church, for his bride. And so the scripture here says to us, he goes, you're adulterers and adulteresses. And he goes, know you not that the friendship with the world is enmity with God. It's not, in other words, if I choose the world, I'm choosing to become an enemy of God. How terrible is that? That's what the scripture is telling us. And this is why the flesh is an enemy of us. Because the flesh is not leading me to God. The flesh is leading me to hell. And so therefore I've got to put away my desires of my flesh. And I've got to bring on board God's plan for me. What's God's purpose in my life? Because God is saving me. Whereas if I want to have it my way, I'm going to lose myself. I can't trust in myself. You can't trust in yourself. But I'll tell you who you can trust in. God. In Jesus. He is the way, the truth and the life. None shall see the Father if not through Him. 
And so that's why when if we are married unto, unto the Lord, He's saying to us, we got to stop being adulterers. we got to stop, you know, running away from Him and practicing these other things. we got to be sure that we say, Jesus is the groom, we are the bride, and He's the only master of our soul. So you see, the flesh is very, very deceiving, isn't it? It acts like our friend, but it's not. It's a deceiver. It's a liar. And it's an enemy of God. But also, it's touch on the world. So, But I'll tell you what, before we move on to the world, I want to give you a scripture, brethren. How to dominate the flesh and your desires. Get this word. James chapter 4, verse 7. This is the answer, brethren. If you take this word in your heart, and when those fleshly desires come upon you, you will overcome with this word if you believe it. Then you will submit yourselves, therefore, to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Because you know what? The devil, brethren, comes and he touches the desires of your flesh. He comes and he brings forth things to tempt you through your flesh, through the lusts, through the desires of the flesh. This is what he does. And when he comes to tempt... That's where we need to be ready. You see, Jesus said, pray and watch, lest you enter into temptation. The enemy comes to tempt, to tempt us through the desires of the flesh. So this is why when we have a life of prayer, of fasting, of reading the word, of, submit, of obeying the word of God, this is you and me submitting to God. And when we submit to God, the devil still comes, brethren. But when he comes and he throws those fiery darts against our faith, when he throws that, that you know, when he tries to tempt us in our flesh, because we have been submitting to God, straight away we will know, this is not of God, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And God himself will give us the strength in the spirit to not let our fleshly desires go away. Because you see, the fruit of the spirit, one of the parts of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. And God will give you, give me self-control that in that moment when the enemy tries to cause us, of our free will to draw away from God through the desires of our flesh, we will say, huh? no, you don't. In Jesus' name, I submit this flesh at the feet of Jesus. And so we don't run away where the devil wants us to go. So this is why the scripture says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil. So it requires resisting. But I'll tell you what, if we don't submit to God, we won't be able to resist the devil. A lot of people try to resist the devil without submitting to God. It's going to always fail, brethren. We must always submit to God in what he wants us to do so that when, when the temptations come, we have the strength of the Lord to be able to resist the devil. And once resisted the devil by submitting to God, he will flee from you. You see how good God is? You no longer will need to flee from the devil. The devil will flee from you. That's what the scripture says. But we need to learn to put everything in its order. Because that's what God has come to do. To show us how to take on board those weapons of warfare. And to use them accordingly for the victorious life in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So now let's go, brethren, to look at what it says about the world. The world is the second of the big enemy that we have in this life. Now, I mentioned in brief a few things of what the worldly systems are. Now, those systems are systems that the devil has used the minds of and influenced the minds of many people to create these systems to lure people in to those things. This is why you see that there is so much in the world these days of pornography. That's why you see that there's so much in the world of fighting. 
the, you've, you've got like, you know, all them fighting sort of shows of um, kickboxing, boxing, wrestling, all these things which cause people to fight each other and cause them to, you know, some, that sometimes they come out bleeding and some unconscious. That's not of God. God has told us to put away violence. You see the good thing about Scripture? You can easily see something and point it out because when we read Scripture, brethren, and we fill ourselves with the Scripture, you'll be able to see something. You hear something and you straight away, the Scripture comes and it's quick and it's alive and it's powerful and it says, that's not mine. And he gives us the sermon to know what is God's and what is not God's. What is pleasing to God and what is not pleasing to God. So when we look at the scripture, brethren, about the world, let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 9, brethren. We're looking at the enemy being the world. Those worldly systems. When we look at those worldly systems, brethren, it says to us here, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now, get this, brethren, in order for you and I to go and do things of the world, firstly, we need to be enticed in our desires of the flesh, because nobody will get up and go somewhere that they don't feel like going. So when we have that desire to go, when we have that fleshly desire to want to try something and be somewhere, then we get up, we will ourselves to go. And we start doing those things. We practice them things. And so that's what the scripture is saying to us here. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So the things of the flesh are constantly in their mind. They don't really think about God's word. They don't really think about whether God will be pleased with them or not. And this is talking to Christians. This is talking to people in churches, brethren. It's talking to people that even in a church there are fleshly people that... Once they've left the church and they go out there on the street, wherever they are, whatever thought comes into their mind, they don't even think of whether that pleases God or not. And then they go and they do it because they put themselves above God. You know what that's called? Idolatry. We've put ourselves before God. That's called idolatry. That's abominable before God. Because his commandment was, in, in the Ten Commandments, he says, You shall not have gods before me. You shall have no other god before me. And a lot of people put themselves before God. And create of themselves an idol. You know, many times the scripture tells us things. And we harden our heart and we say, Lord, you know my heart. You know it's not time for me to do this. And we make excuses not to follow the word of God. It's not that we didn't understand it. Is that we put ourselves before God. That's called idolatry. These are sinful things, brethren. And this is why it says, the, 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 For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. How wonderful is that? Because those who are after the Spirit, brethren, you know, listening to what the Spirit says in their conscience, the Spirit says to them, you know, don't go to this place. Go there, you know, don't do this, do that. And we start following what the Spirit of the Lord says to us to do. And, you know, the Spirit of God always leads us to the obedience of His Word. He always leads us to the Scriptures to obey those things that we have read and heard in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when we obey the Lord, we are in the Spirit. We are abiding in Him and Him in us. This is what it means that those that are after the Spirit, we take thought of the things of the Spirit. We think twice before we're going to speak something. We think, is this going to offend God? Is this going to offend the person that I'm going to talk to? Because God says, don't offend people. So therefore, I want to please God. So if this is going to offend somebody, I don't want to offend that person because I want to be obedient to the Lord. You see how somebody who's, who's thinking about the Lord always is thinking in the Spirit because we're thinking of upholding His Word with our very life. 
When sometimes we get mocked and ridiculed for being Christians, for not going with the multitude where they go, for not practicing what other people practice, we hold that and we, 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 we bear that burden. We bear that burden and suffer for his sake of what they say to us or what they might do to us. But you know what? We, bur we, we suffer that burden for his cause because we want to uphold his word in our life. That is what he's talking about. Those who are of the spirit, they do mind the things of the spirit because they're always thinking, is this going to please you, God? That's the same way with every single thing we do. Where I'm going to go, what I'm going to wear, how I'm going to speak. Every single thing about us, we've got God in our mind and upholding His Word and giving Him glory. Praise be the name of Jesus. Let's continue to read, brethren. We're going up until verse 9. And it says, For to be carnally minded is death. Look at that. You see, I told you this flesh was deceitful. The desires of the flesh are deceitful. It's telling me, Oh, you know, don't get up to pray early in the morning. The Spirit is saying, Get up and pray. <laughs> But the flesh is saying, it's too cold. Take another 10 minute nap. That's the flesh right there. And that's where we got to go. You deceitful flesh. I'm getting up. I'm going to give glory to the Lord. Even though I'm feeling tired. Because that's what the Spirit of the Lord has told me to do. You see, this is what makes the difference. Because just like that, brethren, it's telling us that carnally minded is dead. When we start to think on these things that are carnal, which are, which are uh, in opposition to the Word of God, that's sinful. When we let our imaginations go, in, I mean, everybody has thoughts. Everyone has thoughts. There's no one that doesn't have bad thoughts that have come. But to dwell on the thoughts, that's another issue altogether. If you choose straight away, when you have an evil thought, you say, no, that's evil. I'm not going to be thinking that. I'll cast that out in the name of Jesus. But if we dwell on those thoughts, oh yeah, I wonder what it would look like if I ran over my brother or sister. Those are evil thoughts now. That is sinful. That is leading us to have desires of the flesh. A kind of mind is dead. Because we're desiring the death of our brother. That would make us no, no different than Cain who killed his brother Abel. The first murderer in, in humanity. But it says, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You know why? Because when we've pleased God by upholding the word of God, even if it means we've suffered for his cause, how wonderful does it feel in our spirit when we are being confirmed by God? And he says, well done, my son. Well done, my daughter. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. That's beautiful, brethren, because we rejoice in the Lord in his wonderful presence. But as we continue reading... In verse 7, the scripture also says to us, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is an enemy against God. It says, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So it won't want to submit to God, and it can't. Because it always wants to go the other way. So this is why we need to submit to God. That's why the human will that God has given us, we need to submit that to the Lord whether we like it or not, because we know that he has got the best interest for us. He's got salvation, eternal life. He's got it all. We don't have anything. <laughs> Hallelujah. And in verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And you know why they can't please God? Because people who desire the flesh and, and make that decision, they've not applied faith. Because when we apply faith, we can please God. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. And when we've chosen carnal decisions, we've chosen not to apply faith. We've chosen not to obey God. But when we choose to apply the faith and we say, no, I'm going to obey the Lord. Then we can please God. And it says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God well, in you. Now think of that for a moment. Is God directing your life in the spirit? Have you been doing, you know, the necessary things that we always get up to? Because we all got busy things during the day to do, you know. We've all got a house to clean, uh, perhaps a pet to give food to and look after. We've all got things to do. Others have jobs, university to go to, many things. 
children that people are raising in a family. We've all got things to do. And they may not be sinful things. But I'll tell you what, when was the last time that you're doing something and you feel that pull in your heart and says, knock, knock, time to pray. Or it says, knock, knock, time to go read the word. In your conscience, no one has spoken, but you just feel it. it's like, hmm, I've not spent time with the Lord today. Does that pop in our mind? Does it come in our heart? Because if it doesn't, I'll tell you what, it's worrying. Because the Spirit of God will speak in our spirit always. Because His intention is to get to the end. And He will always lead us to the obedience of His Word. But if we don't know when He's told me that, could it be that we've, that we've told Him to leave? Could it be that that's why I don't know how to discern if it's Him or not? But I'll tell you what. There's an opportunity today to repent from that. There's an opportunity today that God has given us because you know what? God is so good. He's given us life today. And what does the scripture say? The scripture says that His mercies are new each day. You got life today? Then you got God's mercy today. We can make the decision today if we've not felt that for a while. If we've not you know, follow the Lord in what He's wanting us to do. So He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, this is important, brother. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's very important to understand, brother. Because, you see, somebody who's not a Christian is not of God. Because someone who's not a Christian does not have the Spirit of God. They've not believed in Jesus as the Lord and Savior. They've not received the promise of the Father yet. But if we, who are here today, and we say, I'm Christian, I believe in Jesus, He's my Lord, He's my Savior. But He says, but if any man have not the Spirit, then God is saying through His Word that we are not His. And this is something that we need to ponder in our heart right now. That is very important for us to understand. Because as I mentioned at the start, the Spirit of God gives witness with our spirit if we are His sons or daughters. How do I know that the Spirit speaks to me? How do I know? Well, there's an easy way. What I was mentioning just before. The Spirit of God, often we are busy doing our things. But does it come into our thought? Does it come into our mind? Is God reminding us daily? Is God bringing it into our conscience? And is He, you know, when we are doing the wrong things or when we are in an opportunity to do the right thing? Yeah, it's not just that if we're doing wrong things. If we are found in the opportunity to do something that is right. Let me just give you an example of that. You go shopping. You go to the cash person, you know, the teller who's helping you. And all your shopping for that day is $10. And you give that person $20. They're supposed to give you $10 back, right? But they give you a $50 note because they're so busy and wrapped up with doing what they're doing that they didn't realize they gave you a 50. Now you can walk away from there go and praise the Lord. You've blessed me today. I got free shopping and extra cash. Or you can do what is righteous and the right thing and say, hmm. The Lord indicates to me that I need to do what is right. The Lord says to me, I'm not going to be right with Him if I walk away like this. Because I would not like that to happen to me. And so therefore, Jesus also said, do unto others as you will have done unto yourself. So you see, it's not just about the righteous deeds of God. There's so many things of obeying the Word of God there. That truly the Holy Spirit of God will definitely not let you walk away like that. But yet there's been cases with people who have even brought that and go, Yeah, Lord, I bring my tithes and my offerings right here from that type of money. Would God accept that? Absolutely not. It would be very different if somebody was giving it to you saying, No, it's yours, you take it. And if it was theirs to begin with. But if we are taking something like that and we hide it. 
then we need to do what is right before the Lord. And so therefore, brethren, God will always be speaking to us. He will be speaking to you in your conscience, in my conscience. But let me show you, brethren, how do we overcome the world? When we go to Romans chapter 8, verse 13 and 14. Praise be the Lord. The scripture says here, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Is it clear, brethren? If we allow ourselves to be guided by God, God is not going to let us go to the worldly things. God is not going to let us get involved in worldly things. God is not going to let us, you know, let our fleshly desires go out of control. He's not going to let that happen. He's going to cut it straight through. And that's exactly what God wants you to learn. That's exactly what God wants me to learn. You know what? It's the difference between a victorious Christian, a Christian who lives victorious day by day in Christ, and somebody who's always stumbling and falling, and then getting back up, and then stumbling and falling again into sin, and then all of a sudden you see them 10 years later, and they're trying to stand up firm in the Lord, but then you see them getting tangled in other things again. The difference is, brethren, between those who allow themselves to be guided by the Spirit of God, who listen to the voice of the Lord and do the things that God tells them to do. That's the difference. The other side, there's other people that they'll be like, Oh Lord, yeah, I know I should go to church. I know you're telling me, but look at that winter cold, Lord. And uh, they're making all these excuses. And yet the Lord has a blessing for you where he's telling you to go, where he's telling you to be, what he's telling you to do and what he's telling you to say. There's blessing in the Lord always when he does that, brethren. But you and I choose whether we miss out on those blessings or whether we receive them. And the scripture also says, yeah, it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So now I want to go to a portion, brethren. I want to show you how Jesus overcame these three enemies. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, all the way to verse 11. I'm just going to read it very, very brief. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Let's have a look how Jesus overcame the desires of the flesh. Now, it says in the scripture, and when the tempter came to him, this is when the devil came up to Jesus. Now, Jesus had already spent 40 days of fasting. But the scripture says, when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Why bread? Because Jesus had not eaten for 40 days. Of course he was hungry. The Bible says he was hungry. He was hungry, but... And he had the power as well to, to change things from stone to bread. He could do it. But the tempter came trying to tempt the flesh. But verse 4 says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In other words, I am not listening to you. I am listening to you. To my heavenly father. Where was that scripture given? That scripture was given in the Old Testament. In the first five books of Moses. Where God said to the people. He says that God permitted the people of Israel to suffer through moments of hunger. And thirst. Because God wanted to show them that mankind does not live by food and water alone. He says they live by the word of God. How do you think Moses was able to be up in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights where the scripture registers in more than three occasions that he had no food and no water in all that time? Humanly speaking, it is impossible. But godly speaking, all things are possible for God. 
Because he was there receiving the word of God. Receiving those first five books of Moses that we have in our Bibles today. That's why he was up there 40 days and 40 nights. But as he was in the presence of God, a fasting that was inspired by the Lord, while the very life was there with him, how is he going to die? If the giver of life was that right there with him. So in this case, brethren, when the desires of the flesh come, we overcome that with the word of God. This is how Jesus overcame the enemy. He says it's written, yeah? Where is it written? It was written in the, in the parchments, in the rolls, in the scrolls that they had. The word of God. He was quoting the scripture to him. Let's look at what happened after that. Verse 5 to 7. How did Jesus overcome Satan? Now this is a very important one. Because remember, Satan is using these things. But then he also comes at it himself. And how did Jesus overcome the enemy? It says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him up in a pinnacle of the temple. In other words, on the top of the temple. And so Jesus is looking down. And he's up very high. But then the enemy says to him in verse 6, And saith unto him, If you are the Son of God, Cast yourself down, for it is written. Look at that. The devil's now quoting scripture to Jesus. But twisted scripture is not scripture of God. He says to him, It is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. He was quoting to him from Psalms chapter 91, brethren. The devil was quoting scripture to Jesus. This is why, brethren, it is registered in there for your learning and mind that we need to know doctrine. We need to know God. We need to know his word because the devil comes and when he comes, whether it might not be a, a, a tempting in the flesh, but when he comes and he speaks, he'll twist the word. He'll twist the doctrine to try and make us fall. And if we're not firm and grounded in the doctrine of Christ, many have fallen into false things and false doctrines because of that reason. For not being grounded and rooted in the truth of Christ. But let's look at how Jesus answered. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You see that? How you overcame the false scripture with the true scripture? Because the devil was using scripture in a twisted manner, in the incorrect interpretation. Yes, it's true that, you know, the Bible says that the angels will come, lest you dash your foot against the stone. But he was trying to get Jesus to throw himself off of there. And, and hiddenly, Hiddenly, he was trying to get Jesus to obey what he would say. And Jesus was not there to obey anything that the devil's got to say. We are not here to obey anything that the devil has to say. We are here to obey what God has to say. What Jesus tells us and the teaching of the Lord so that we can live a victorious life the way that Jesus teaches us. So if we overcome the world and the flesh, brethren, we've got to overcome with the scripture. Because Jesus said unto him, it's written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So he defeated the Satan there. But how does he defeat the world? Let's look at verse 8 and 11. He says, again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Look, that's, that's talking not just in that time. It's not just talking about the Roman Empire. It's also talking about... The United Kingdom, the kingdom in Spain, the kingdom that all these kingdoms throughout this time. He shows it all to him like in a vision all. And you know what that is? That's having love of the world. He says the devil takes him up into exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdom of the world and the glory of them. Verse 9. And says unto him, all these will I give to you if you will fall down and worship me. How did Jesus respond? Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, 
Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Three times the enemy tried. Tried with the flesh. Tried himself. Tried with the world. But each time he was defeated with the word of God. And this is how we need to also overcome, brethren. The work that God shows us that he has done in us as Christians. You see, when we started reading this this, in this message, we started saying that the title of this message is The Victorious Are Found Worthy. You remember the scripture said at the very beginning that when we take part in the bread and in the cup of the Lord, that we need to be found worthy. Because the unworthy will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But that's why it said, let us examine ourselves. And remember, we've been seeing how is it that we examine ourselves? We have to examine ourselves through the word of God and examine what we've been doing, what we've been saying, what's been passing through our mind and what we've been allowing ourselves to do. Have we overcome with the scripture, the desires of the flesh, the world, those systems of the world? Have we overcome the enemy in the name of Jesus? Because this is what proves in your life and in mine that the work of God through his spirit is alive in us as Christians. Therefore, brethren, if as we examine ourselves, we're going to spend a time in prayer now, brethren. But as we examine ourselves, you know, because God points out things in our life. Sometimes as we examine ourselves, God points out and might point out and says like, hey, you got to go and ask that person for forgiveness because you had a quarrel. You had a problem with that person and you left it that way. You've not fixed this with that person. It could be something like that. But yet God speaks into our conscience those things that align our life to the word of God. And if we obey the spirit of God, then God restores us. Then we are found worthy because we are in obedience to his spirit and to his word. But if we say, no, Lord, you know that today is not the day. You know that it was my fault. And we start to justify ourselves. Then let it not be, brethren, that if God is saying to us, we've got something to fix. If he's not approving, if he's, if he's not showing us that he's, that he's uh, pleased with our life and how we've been living. Then would that mean I am unworthy in this occasion to take part in the bread and cup of the Lord? Because I'll tell you what, the fear of the Lord, it is worth it to have the fear of the Lord. And say, Lord, forgive me. You know, it is better to fix those things before the Lord. That we may take part in that obedience with the Lord. Well, let us come into words of prayer, brethren.